Hi guys, and welcome to a solo stream on the lives of Solon and Publicola, or Publius Valerius, also known as Publicola. Uh, we don't have Rashid this week, so I'm going to continue on uh, to catch up a bit on Plutarch. So we start with Solon, and he comes after, if you recall last time, we had Lycurgus and Numa. Lycurgus is also a lawgiver, as is Salon here, one the former for Sparta, and Salon now for Athens. Unlike Lycurgus, immediately we see that he's known for his tables of laws, which come through us um, in a form of poetry. And Plutarch gives a bit of his background, because who was this guy who came in? He also wasn't... Um, necessarily bred to be in the position of lawgiver but as plutarch states he is generally agreed that he was the son of exestides man of moderate wealth and power in the city but most of noble stock and his mother was cousin to pesistratus who will later become a tyrant and will later be part of salon's downfall his origins seem to be that of a traitor and then um, but it would also always have this captivation with learning something new. And so after a while, I think of trading, we seem to think he gets obsessed with the form of poetry, which it, it itself is a form of oratory. And Salon really comes to the fore then when he takes to these erratical performances in the public square in Athens. So I'm thinking back before, we haven't really had a great orator in what we've talked about yet. Theseus was a man who went to go to the Minotaur sacrifice in um, in um, Crete because it was seen as a noble thing to do. We're not, we're not filled with these great speeches. Neither do I remember one from Romulus. This is the first time in which we see someone taking to a public scare, square and captivating people. I suppose this is why he's known as a, po a man of popular popularity amongst the populace, which is another reason why Plutarch is going to twin him with Poplicola, literally named so that he is of the people later with uh, Rome and the foundation of the Roman Republic. But he was always fascinated with learning something new, and uh, Plutarch describes to him the sayings, each day grew older and learned something new, and yet no, was no admirer of riches. Wealth I would have, but wealth by wrong procure I would not. Justice, even if slow, is sure. Whether something happened there in his trading background, it's unclear. But as the trader, we don't see him so much as a manipulator or someone obsessed with wealth, but more in that Hesiod, even Carlalian sense, where Hesiod said work was a shame to none. So it was, I was a trader because I went, to went out and wanted to work. There's an ethical foundation to him in his trade. Solon's softness and profuseness, though, however, distinguishes himself from the likes of the previous lawgiver like Kyrgyz, where it was siege mentality that he wanted to create in Sparta and, of course, was uncle to a king so was much more already inbound in the nobility than this sort of soft trader uh, who becomes a philosophical poet in salon um but of course that manifests itself into how the laws are interpreted uh, interpreted so they are taken down on these tables of laws and they're done so in a sort of heroic verse. This is different to, oh yeah, we have a retra with Lycurgus, but that is because he wanted everything to remain spoken without being written down because if it was written down, it would become the sort of written constitution. It could be uh, codified and then left to later men to manipulate interpretations from the code. If it remained the great retra, it somehow remained this pure thing which was dictated to Lycurgus from the Pythia at the, uh, the Apollo Delphi. So what exactly is Solon talking about when he gives these orations in the public uh, square? We can see here I said that he uses cunning to overcome the Megarians. What I'm talking about there is there's this war between the Megarians and the Athenians over who has ownership over the island of Salamis. And he gets given the, the, this mission to try and retake it because he gives these great speeches saying, we should renew our war with Megaria. We should not settle for the fact Salamis is not ours. It was obviously a territorial dispute. 
And his cunning that he uses is he gets the men of Megaria to go to a port where he claims um, Athenian women are waiting for him. And then they're not Athenian women at all, but soldiers dressed up uh, to, to lure them in like a siren almost. And then he springs the trap. So we see that although he is saying wealth, justice will come upon those who procure wealth incorrectly, he is willing to use cunning to take something like the island of Salamis back into possession of Athens. So was he a man who was dishonest? Was he overly covetous? Either way, this act gave a new life to an energy. Uh, Plutarch says here, the Athenians were tired with tedious and difficult war they conducted against the Megarians for the island of Salamis and made a law that it should be death to any man by writing or speaking to ascend to the city to endeavor to recover it. Salon vexed at the disgrace, perceiving thousands of the youth. So he, again, this is a popular upspring from the youth against the existing Areopagi, the existing archons, the existing power structure in Athens. So he stands with the elegy and says, I am a herald come from Salamis the fair. My news from thence, my verses shall declare. The poem is called, was called Salamis, a hundred verses elegantly written and had been sung. So these are the verses though, not of the court poet, but of a political activist. As he grew fame and powerful, that's when he does the cunning trick on the Megarians. So, when he came to Athens and grew, um, when he came back to Athens, he grew to power and was helped to be elected as one of these archons. His advice in favor of defending the oracle vented to give aid and not to suffer the Kyrgyzians to profane it, but to build to maintain the honor of the god. So again, we have this link to Delphia. We had with Lycurgus, got him most repute among the Greeks. And when he gets in charge of the magistrates and archons, because of his, he seemed to be this cunning man who wants to renew the renew this image of a glorious Athens. We get to his reforms as archon. The wise of the Athenians, perceiving Solon was of all men the, not the only one implicated in the troubles of this uh, sedition party, but he had not joined in the extraction of the rich, and was involved in the necessities of the poor, pressed him to secure the commonwealth and compose the differences. So his this idea that he did not like riches came, comes into his archonship. He has a discharge of all existing debts immediately. He devalues the currency, and he has a repeal of these draconian laws which came before him. Draco, where it said, if any man commits any crime, the punishment is death. So in that sense, Salon is bringing in a subtlety that didn't exist before. And it's also a subtlety that's not present in like Kyrgyz. Now, was, I, I, he was chosen archon by election. Again, dubious measures. We talked about how dubious like Kyrgyz's idea of the, his reforms to the Senate, how one was elected to the Senate by... Uh, people shouting and then a, someone who was not looking at who was present say, oh, this man got the loudest shout. There was a saying in this current before the election that when things are even, again, this appeal to equality, which we've had before, there never can be war. And this pleased both parties and the wealthy and the poor. Salon seemed to then become a, a mediator between the two. So did we have an Athens before Salon's archonship, a place where the distribution of wealth in a society had become too much into the hands of the rich who, well, that's one thing and that's, you could call that quite a leftist take. But if that rich, if there is that imbalance and they're losing things like territory on Salamis and they're still imposing draconian laws and they're not just letting you live about your life, all of these ingredients fill up to want to find the mediator. The mediator comes from Salon because he has the voice of the people but he's from an okay background, as we discussed earlier. So he knows a bit more how to go about getting into the institutions. I am slightly reminded of something like Emmanuel Macron. Um, there, excuse me. Um, how was he pushed in 
to an institution that perhaps he shouldn't have been allowed to, to, to quell a voice of the people. So when we think about Salon, I think we should think about these things. He countered the Areopagus, as we said, with second counsel more common. He allowed uh, commoners to become part of the jury. And this is why if you see in certainly like this idea of the growth of a republic, the growth of a democracy, people all, will always quote Salon or reference him as this great lawgiver. There are three key members of uh, so, sort of subsequent leaders of Athens around this time that people associate with certain modes of government. Draco is the one of the draconian law, the man who will push down and punish anything. So you, you would have seen maybe the COVID measures would have been called draconian. They're talking about Draco, Solon's predecessor. And then if they're talking about an outright tyrant who uses the voice of the people to become a dictator, that is person who's going to come after Salon, that's Pesistratus. Salon's meant to be this great middleman, this brilliant idyllic reformer. The institutions he set up are for the greater good of democracy. So the United States in the 20th century would love, people of sort of the Hoover Institute, I think, would look back at Salon and try and say that they are carrying on these ideals, these democratic ideals, which date back to the figure that Plutarch is talking about here. So then something strange happens. Uh, he basically enacts these reforms and then heads on his travels. He seems to think, right, my time as Archon is up. Here are the reforms I have instituted in Athens. And it's time for me to see a bit more of the world. In which case, uh, you can guess what's going on uh, in Athens while he leaves. There begins to be a power vacuum and people like Pesistratus can use the same means that Salon used, i.e. I can garner the voice of the people against the rich or against this other faction, uh, but to do so without the subtlety of a Salon. And of course, without the worth, the merit, that work ethic we talked about earlier, that Hesiodic work ethic, twinned with that ability to actually do something for the Athenians in war, which Salon had established himself. Um, with the battle against the Megarians. So why does he, I don't know why he travels to Egypt, Cyprus, Sardis. Um, if you recall from Lycurgus, Lycurgus did the travels. It made more sense to me the way the story is told from Plutarch's perspective, where Lycurgus does the travels because he does not want to be seen to be the tyrannical uncle to his nephew. I believe it was Cleisthenes. Um, I could have got that wrong. No, I think it was some some other name, but his nephew, who was this boy king, um, was going to be ruled by Lycurgus had he stayed. So he has to leave and see the world. And then perhaps he gets his ideas of all these different constitutions and brings back to Sparta this uh, these different ideas of how you should, you should implicate reform. And of course, by leaving, when we have the boy king, he returns into a place where people want him. Solon here leaves at the complete opposite time. He leaves when his laws are established, but not, don't seem to be as established as Lycurgus. Lycurgus implemented a siege mentality in Sparta. Remember he said, we would not need walls because our very men themselves would be the walls to our polity. Whereas Lycurgus, we already see there could be factions developing. You're a mediator between the rich and the poor. He didn't do the land reforms that Lycurgus did. He didn't go that far. Um, he didn't do the, the necessity of the communal eating. There is not, he is a mediator between rich and poor, but he is not a man to create a hive mentality or a hive structure the way Lycurgus did in Sparta. So when he leaves, it's not like when Lycurgus leaves. Um, it's leaving the, the door open for reform or to undo your own work, which occurs. But nevertheless, when he's on these travels, there's this story that he meets Croesus of Lydia. Now, Plutarch is skeptical as to whether these line up at all um, because of the dates involved. Croesus is also involved in Herodotus's histories because Cyrus the Great of Persia is going to be eventually take his lands from him in the build up to the uh, Persian invasion and the battles of Marathon. 
and Thermopylae and all of that. It's going to happen in later generations, but it's it's meant to start with Persian incursion into Lydia. So there's this story of Solon traveling to Lydia and visiting Croesus. By this point, Solon has had the reputation of the re great reformer of Athens and instigating um, you know, ideas of balanced court system, the idea of two councils to counterweight each other uh, between the old aristocracy, the Areopagi, and then the the people in that secondary council. So Croesus is interested in the figure of Solon, and he's, but Croesus has cemented all this great vast wealth. So he brings him in as the story goes and says, look at my wealth. How could I not be the happiest man on earth? What say you, Solon? You are known for your wisdom. Again, maybe there's something to the way everything Solon decreed seemed to be in poetical form, that people thought there was a, a greater gravity to what he was saying and a greater, an echoing back to Homer almost, an echoing back to Hesiod. But nevertheless, he visits uh, the treasury of Croesus and says, no, you, you are the richest, but you're not the happiest. I, I know my mate, Tellus, uh, who was happier. And all, he, all Tellus did was work an honest life and get an honest pay and receive a decent reputation for being uh, an honorable man. And let's, let's read some of Plutarch around this. Aesop, who wrote the fables, being then at Sardis upon Croesus' invitation and very much esteemed, was concerned that Salon was so ill-received and gave him this advice. Salon, let your converse with kings be either short or seasonable. Cyrus, being surprised and sending uh, to some to inquire what manner god this Salon was. So again, we have Cyrus of Persia inculcating into the story a little bit. And here I have a painting on the right-hand side of Gerard uh, van Hunthorst of here is Croesus and Salon on the right hand side giving him counsel. On the left, we see Salon in action, according to the 1914 Walter Crane illustration. But in other depictions of the Croesus and Salon tale, you see Persian troops in the background because it's meant to be that all of Croesus's wealth is but arbitrary and Salon is the last laugh. So that's why Plutarch here brings in Cyrus. It says, Cyrus being surprised and sending some to inquire what manner God this Solon was, who alone he invoked in this extremity, Croesus told him the whole story, saying he was one of the wise men of Greece, whom I sent for not to be instructed or to learn anything that I wanted, but that he should be uh, see and be a witness of my happiness. The loss of which was, it seems, to be a greater evil than the enjoyment was a good. For when I had them, they were goods only in opinion. But now the loss of them has brought upon me intolerable and real evils but again let's talk about the end of the travels this slide is entitled his travels and return so whether or not the Croesus episode occurred in that manner it's a nice little tale he returns of course to a fractious Athens when Solon was gone the citizens began to quarrel like Kyrgyz headed the plain this is a different like Kyrgyz to the one the Spartan king uh, Megacles, the son of Alcmaeon, those to the seaside, the Pisistratus, is the hill party in which uh, were the poorest people. So Pisistratus represents the poor. He is a real uh, man, a populous leader. Uh, the Thetes and the greatest enemies to the rich was this Pisistratus. Affairs sending the Solon returned. Pisistratus appearing the most tractable for he was extremely smooth and engaging in his language. You can see here, Pisistratus, he was a distant cousin, uh, nephew, I think. Is it. His mother was a cousin to Shalon, according to some sources. So he seemed to be steeped in how to use the same method Shalon had used previously. So he was smooth and engaging in language was Pisistratus, and a great friend to the poor and moderate in his resentments. What nature had not given him, he had the skill to imitate. Hence why... Why is Plutarch to Solon and not Pesistratus? Well, one, because Pesistratus is seen to become a tyrant, but also there is an imitative nature to Pesistratus that there is not in Solon. Solon quickly discovered, though, the truth of his character, that th this guy would feign injury 
by other factions to try and invoke greater conflict within the the, the political scene in Athens. Now, when Pisistratus having and this is this is how Plutarch tells us this. Now, when Pisistratus having wounded himself was brought into the marketplace in a chariot and stirred up the people, as if he had been thus treated by his opponents because of his political conduct, and a great many were enraged and cried out, "Salon, coming dose to him." said, and basically calls him out, thus, O son of Hippocrates, is a bad copy of Homer's Ulysses, i.e. the cunning trickster. You do to trick your countrymen what he did to deceive his enemy. So there's this interesting distinction there between what was Solon willing to do. He was willing to be cunning against the Megarians to win back Salamis, but when he sees Pesistratus implying this, uh, using the same tools, but against his own countrymen, this is beyond the pale to Solon. Exhorting them not thus tamely to lose their liberty, but the, basically the soothing words and the, the, the stirring words at times as well, soothing to when he needs to be soothing, stirring to when he needs to stir the populace of Pisistratus proves too much. Salon, though he's come back, has seemed to have lost the touch on the political scene somewhat. Before it was any easier to stop the rising tyranny, but now, when Salon realized it needed to be stopped, the great and more glorious action to destroy it, when it was already begun and had gathered strength, proved too much. This is interesting. It was like the time. There's still this idea of timing to Plutarch and, uh, uh, and greatness. You have to time it correctly. It's not so much that you are the light living fountain that Carlyle seems to espouse. But if we remember, like Kyrgyz seemed to have this, a greater finger of, on the pulse of when to do things, when to enact your laws, when to reform the Senate, when to then mysteriously go off and die after you lived through the, after you'd obtained the words of your people that they would obey the laws you had enacted and set down for them. Salam. So by going on these travels at the wrong time, then by realizing the true nature of Pesistratus at the wrong time, too late. You've gained up too much of well support. Seems to not have that finger on the pulse, that ear to the wind, uh, the way true great men may have. So being accused of murder before the Areopagus, he came quickly to clear himself, but his accuser did not appear. So again, these I think these are more cutting moves by Pesistratus, though, of course, the, the reality of the situation is lost to us. Now, Solon, having begun the great work in verse, the history of fable in the Atlantic island, which he had learned from the wise men in Sice, and thought it convenient for the Athenians to know, abandoned it. Not as Plato says, by reasons of want of time, but because of his age. So, was he seen before an Areopagus trial for murder, or did he just get old? Plutarch seems to side with the latter. He just slowly got old. Each day I grow older and learn something new, was still what he said, though, and he maintained that mantra right up until his death. There are accounts that say he lived after Pesistratus and seized the government. Um, uh, though we don't, I don't think we have direct sources, but Plutarch claims that Heraclides Ponticus asserts this a long time. But Phanias Arisian says, not two full years, for Pesistratus began his tyranny, tyranny when Cumius was archon. And Phanias says Solon died under Hegistratus, who succeeded Cumius. So whether or not he did outlive him by outlive the Pesistratus tyranny by. Uh, a uh, decent amount of time or not, he was ineffectual in his old age to overcome it, even though he'd fallen out with the character of Pesistratus. So, we've, we've kind of got our first dapple there with populism. And Plutarch is going to compare that with Publicola, something like Publicola, whose actual name was Publius Valerius. This is going to all be about the ending of the line of Roman kings and the beginning of the Roman Republic. We're talking about, uh, I think with uh, Solon, we're about 580 BC to about 560 BC in terms of the, the key events of his life. Here we're about 70 years later, around 510 BC, um, up to about 500 BC, the enactment of, of the Republic of Rome. So, why am I, this is always how Plutarch starts off the second of the lives. Why am I interested in comparing Shalom to this man, Publicola? 
To him, this is him being Salam, we compare public Kolo, who received this letter title from the people for his merit as a noble accession to the former name Publius Valerius. He descended from Valerius, a man amongst the early citizens. At this time, Rome remained under its kingly government. And should the government fall into a republic, Publicola knew he would become a chief man in the community. Um, so was he looking for an excuse? There are other uh, people of noble families. And Brutus, Lucius Brutus, is the key enactor of the republic. At the time, Publius Valerius seems to just go along with it. But the triggering event of the last king, which is Tarquinius Superbus, and there are a few Tarquins going around. Um, so Tarquinius Superbus is the, the tyrant. The straw that breaks the camel's back about his tyranny seems to be this uh, story of Lucretia, where he has this rape or abduction of Lucretia and has her killed. And um, this is a sort of three panel story of it as told by Botticelli. The illegal and wicked accession of Tarquinius Superbus to the crown, says Plutarch, with his making it instead of kingly rule the instrument of insolence, tyranny, having inspired the people with a hatred to his reign upon the death of Lucretia, she killing herself after violence had been done to her. Um, they took on occasions to revolt. The key leader of this was, as I stated before, Lucius Brutus. Engaging in the change came to Valerius before all others, so he seemed to have wanted to confer in Poplicola, Valerius, that he had plans to overcome the tyranny. And when I began reading this, you do begin reading this life, wondering, well, why not choose Brutus himself? He is the one who inculcates the ideal of the Republic. Similar to, you didn't choose any of the second man uh, second man of Salon. You didn't choose the second man of Theseus. But Valerius acquiesced. We'll get to understand why later. Valerius acquiesced that the rule was uh, Brutus's Jew. Valerius, entertaining hopes that he might be elected consul with Brutus, was disappointed, for instead of Valerius, notwithstanding the endeavors of Brutus, Tarquinius Colatinus uh, was chosen, husband of Lucretia. So really this event is seen as the triggering event of the establishment of the Republic of Rome. Two consuls are chosen, one Brutus, who wants to get rid of the tyrant, and of course, uh, this other uh, Tarquin, Tarquinius Colatinus, who was brother of Lucretia, who was obviously seen to have been the aggrieved party, so much so that he should be with consul. So, still, at this point, Publius Valerius is taking a back seat. So, he's troubled with the desire, um, troubled with this, his desire to want to be consul, but also realizing that getting rid of Tarquinius Superbus was, was the right call. But above all, I think what the admiring character that Plutarch finds for Popicola at this point is his loyalty. We are going to see that Tarquinius Superbus is not done. He's not going to relinquish his crown so easily. And he can gather other dissenters, other famous families. I think we see the Vitelli and the Aquili families plotted Tarquin's return. And eventually Tarquin, Tarquinius Colatinus is implicated in this. Um, but there seems to be no indication that Publius Valerius was ever uh, plotting any sort of return to the old order, even though he'd kind of been undone by not getting his consulship. The Vitelli, says Plutarch, were seduced to join this plot, this plot of getting Tarquin, Tarquinius Superbus back to ally themselves to the great houses in the hopes of the Tarquins, and gain emancipation from the violence and imbecility united of their father. They met at the house of the Aquili. Now, there was this one man who was also there, and the resolutions in this house, this plot, was to kill the consuls, and they wrote letters to Tarquin to this effect. But there was this man, Vindicius, secretly, who quitted the house, and went and addressed himself to Valerius, Publicola, whose known freedom and kindness of temper what an inducement. So we talk about characteristics. There seemed to be a hardness, a ruthlessness to, I would say, Lycurgus. There was this idea that perhaps Lycurgus had never dirtied himself in battle. But 
in comparison, Salon is, is, is much more frail, effeminate almost. He's poetical. He is timid. But also, there's a streak of the Socrates in him. He will call out imbeciles, even if they have wealth and status. Um, he will state his mind. But he's not this... He is not a man known for being quick to rise to temper. But neither was Valerius Publius here, apparently. So perhaps that is another twinning of them. We see people of maybe kinder, um, more subtler qualities coming to the fore. Certainly since the time of Romulus and Theseus, where it was heroes of the old age. And um, Theseus still still uh, co-living with the time of Hercules, where it was raw strength. It was the, They both used the club as their instrument. We're moving into a different phase now entirely. When the consuls had quieted the tumult, Vindicius was brought before the orders of Valerius, and the accusation stated the letters were open, which the traitors could make no plea. So eventually this is crushed, and Valerius comes in with Brutus into the real establishment of the Republic. And it said, uh, you're still at the point, though, going through this life where you're wondering, well, why not Brutus? Because it said, in the Romans' opinion, Romans' opinion, opinion of the people, Brutus did a greater work in the establishment of the government than Romulus did in the foundation of the city. Upon Brutus' departure out of the forum, consternation, horror, and silence for some time possessed all that reflected on what was done. Valerius' friends headed the resistance, and the people cried out uh, for Brutus when he was kicked out as part of this plot. But Colotinus's relationship with kings had indeed already rendered him suspicious, and at the new elections in his room, Valerius obtained with high honor the consulship as a just reward for his zeal. Tarquin, despairing of a return to his kingdom by the conspiracy, found a kind reception amongst the Tuscans. And that's when we get to the next episode, um, which will foist Publius Valerius properly into the limelight. And that's the Battle of Silva, Silva Arcia, and the death of Brutus. So really, why why Publius Valerius over Brutus? Well, why, for me, the more captivating and interesting figure, well, captivating, <laughs> I've used that term, it's out there, um, in terms of the development of the Soviet Union is Stalin, much more so than Lenin, because Lenin dies uh, by 1924, by, he suffers a stroke, I think, in 1922. Um, so he's incapacitated for a lot of his later years. Really, he doesn't get to see any of the any of the government he he has helped enact. That's left for Stalin to do. Different characters entirely, and living in different civilizations and different times. But there's still that idea of one is the enactor, the creator of the ideal, and the other is the man who believes in that ideal, but has to be seen to let that ideal form of government actually live in the real world. Uh, in Carlyle's words, to be people need to be actually guided and governed in the end of, at the end of the day. The latter falls to Publius Valerius because we have this Battle of Silvia Arcia where Tarquin has gained trust of the Tuscans. And people wouldn't want this idea of like a republic spreading beyond the borders. So you have, they're surrounded by a Latin League, the there's Sabines, there's Etrurians, and there's Etruscans. So first one that comes up with the Etruscans. Um, Tequin Superbus, Tequin Superbus gains support from them, and they want to go back and Rome. They go out and meet on this battle of Silva, Silva Arcia, and Brutus, being the go-getter, wants to be at the head of the army, ahead of the, the, the true hero in the sense. But what happens is... He sees Arun's Tarquinius, which is Tarquinius Superbus's son. They go out and meet spear to spear. Um, and both are to said to be quelled in the tumult. So although there's no clear victor from the battle, the status quo suits Publius Valerius because the status quo is still the fact that the, the Republic exists and Rome and the Senate, or Rome has its consulships. I should say. But he has to, so he's now, he's now the sole consul. 
uh, after this this brave death in, in combat by Brutus. It's a noble end. It's one which you can really mythologize. And I think Valerius knew this. I can mythologize this event. This is something we don't have with Solon at all. He seems to be much more a solo actor in events. Yes, he's a mediator between the rich and the poor. A mediator, not, not an instigator. But... He didn't have that other foil to, to eulogize the death of, uh, of XYZ, to, to, to have this, we talked about Numa bringing in festivals being important, certain dates, like Kyrgyz brought in the idea of the dance because he knew that to get his forces in rhythm, I need to be able to do things in unison, but he still realized it could be an escape valve and a certain day and a certain festival could honor and reincorporate the belief amongst the people of the institutions you're creating. Don't see much of that in Salon, certainly not what survives. Here we have a little bit more of it uh, by Brutus Valerius, where he realizes he can use the death of Brutus and the figure of Brutus to reinstall the ideological belief in the Republic. And that is classic uh, populist play. Yet, as sole consul, are you now king? And this is an interesting question. Of, of He allowed a lot of reforms that we can see as being similar, to those that Salon did, but as I've stated here, murder before trial was allowed because he thought that it's it's linked to, to the fragility of the Republic, that if you were killing people, were you killing strategic people from noble families to try and bring down the Republic and reinstate, reinstitute Tarkin as king? Yet some parts, says Plutarch, of Valerius' behavior did give offense and disgust to the people because Brutus, whom they had esteemed the father of their liberty, had not presumed to rule without a colleague, but united one and then another to him in his commission. While Valerius, they said, centering all authority in himself, seemed not in any sense a successor to Brutus in the consulship, but to Tarquin in the tyranny. They, the people, can love a Brutus more than Publicola, but, but, what, what has happened here? Publicola has become the king in the Carlalian sense. The way Cromwell must become a king. The way Mirabeau or Danton try and become kings in the French Revolution. The power vacuum needs a king and it will get filled. They love the idea of Brutus because he did never have to share his kingship, but in actuality it was always Brutus who was the true king. The people just didn't see it because he was clever in sharing his consulship. Perhaps uh, perhaps Publicola is not being subtle enough there uh, by going for it with sole consul. But I think this you now have beginnings of how do we actually rule this republic and Tarquin still wants it back. So I, I have um, certain sympathy with Publius Valerius here. He resolved to render the government as well as himself instead of terrible, familiar and pleasant to the people. For whatever he detracted from his authority, he added to his real power. The people still submitting with satisfaction, which they expressed by calling him Publicola. I don't know how that's that uh, fr uh, you know that how nick that nickname got phrased or put in in the words of the people. Was it planted in the words of the people? I think I'm always reminded of uh, Paul Ince, footballer coined his own nickname, and uh, which was the governor, and everyone had to walk around and address him as such. <laughs> so I wonder if Publicola has done something similar here. Let's talk, talk about some of his reforms. We already know what Salon did, so let's compare. First, he supplied the vacancies of the senators, whom either Tarquin long before had put to death or the war lately cut off. Those that he enrolled, they write, amounted uh, to 164, Afterwards, he made several laws which added much to the people's liberty, in particular, one granting offenders the liberty of appealing to the people from the judgment of the consuls, a second, that made it death to usurp any magistracy without the people's consent, a third, for the relief of the poor, taking off their taxes, uh, encouraged their labor. So we saw Salon redistributed the taxes system on a, on a wealth distribution system rather than some sort of flat poll tax or whatever. I mean... The whole idea of whether uh, how well coinage and taxation was that later implicated into these stories is up for debate. But nevertheless, we see taxation as one of the means by which 
he will gain popularity amongst people. So amidst the mildness and moderation for one excessive fault, he instituted uh, one excessive punishment, for he made it lawful without trial to take away a man's life that aspired to a tyranny. And that's what the, the interesting point that I had to my murder before trial. Lab. It's about a murder related that if you aspired to a tyranny. He acquitted the slayer if he produced evidence of the crime. He was honored likewise for the law of touching the treasury. Now, enough about the reforms because we have another battles to do he has seen off the tuscans kind of uh but the etruscans uh there's the have i got that right Lars persona is probably the wealthiest man in Italy, and Tarquin goes to him to help retake uh, Rome for himself. Whilst Tarquin was making preparations in Tuscany for second war against the Romans, it is said that a great portent occurred when Tarquin was king and it all being com completed buildings in the capital, designing whether the, from oracular advice or his own pleasure to erect an earthen chariot upon the top, he instructed a workmanship of the Tuscans of the city of Vey. But soon after he lost his kingdom, the work thus modeled, the Tuscans set in a furnace, clay, showed not the passive qualities which usually attend its nature, but subside and condense upon the evaporation of moisture, but rose swelled into that bulk. Soothsayer looked upon this as a divine and prognostic success, power to those that should possess it. And the Tuscans resolved not to deliver the uh, to the Roman who demanded it, but answered it rather it belonged to Tarquin. So we have this idea of Tarquin was building this great building, um, this great marble. And something, I mean, there's a little bit of myth embellishment here, but something had occurred to make it look really good, basically. And Tarquin is demanding his goods back. Um, Publius Valerius basically says no. And we can compare this to the Elgin marbles that Britain is constantly under pressure to return. Uh, these were not Tarquin's possessions. These are not the possessions of the Greek state. Those marbles are instituted into the British Museum. The British Museum itself is an artifact of British civilization. Um, the whole idea of the museum comes from that cabinet of curiosities extension out into the world and obtaining everything we need to know about ancient Greek and Rome. That's why I'm reading Arthur Hugh Clough's translation or his edit editorship of a John Dryden translation. Because it was that, that civilization in Britain that inspired the resurgence in interest in Greece and Rome to the extent that you could have a British museum with the Elgin marbles in it. Valerius Publius here is, is using a similar tactic. He's saying, no, these goods are not yours, Tarquin. They are that of Rome. The building of the temple of the capital on Jupiter had been vowed by Tarquin, the son of Dem uh, Demaratus, when warring with the Sabines, Tarquinius Superbus, his son or grandson, built but could not dedicate it because he lost his kingdom before it was quite finished. Publicola was ambitious to dedicate it, but the nobility envied him that honor. So it's this idea of if we dedicate it, um, we will institute the fact that, that we are now the, the new power structure. But he was de deprived of that honor himself, but he knew to give it to this man, Horatius. Um, Again, there, now Horatius comes in, and that's what we have here. Uh, Horatius, who will defend the bridge against Lars Porsena in another attempt to get rid of the Republic in Rome. Tarquin, uh, after the great battle, wherein he lost his son in combat with Brutus, fled to Clusium and sought the aid of Lars Porsena. Publicola was, in his absence, chosen as consul a second time, and Titus Lucretius, his colleague, and returning to Rome to show spirit, Yet loftier than Porsena's, built the city Sigluria when Porsena was already in the neighborhood. Nevertheless, Porsena, making a sharp assault, obliged the defendants to retire to Rome. Romans, being dismayed, retreated into the city for their security. So Lars Porsena really did have a, a strong audience, a strong army behind him here. And Rome was in great hazard of being taken. The enemy forcing their way onto the wooden bridge were Horatius Cocles, Seconded by two of the first men in Rome, Herminius and Latius, made head against them. Horatius obtained this name from the loss of one of his eyes in the war. 
Cochlis being like Cyclops. And he held back the enemy. And that's the painting we see here. It is also the lines stated by uh, stated by Macaulay in his Lays of Ancient Rome. Then out spake brave Horatius. So where was, I believe at this time, Publius Valerius had gotten injured. So again, who are you honoring here? Because you began by honoring Brutus. This is me questioning Plutarch. You began by honoring Brutus se seemingly in the, with the establishment of the Republic more than Publicola. And you're kind of ending with this great oration, this, uh, this great tribute to uh, Horatius. The new army of the Tuscans did still make inroads into the country, though. And um, what we see now is a little bit of the cunning that we saw with Salon. So Publicola manages to break bread with uh, Lars Porsena and the Tuscans. Uh, I've overcome the terrors of Porsena yet am vanquished by his generosity, said Valerius. So what, what happens is... the. The defense of Horatius on the bridge seems to give Lars Porsena the idea that, hang on, these people who have instigated the new republic in Rome are actually stronger than Tarquin, Tarquinius Superbus. So why should I ally myself with this losing Tarquin, this man of the old regime, when I can just give myself into an alliance with, um, with Publius Valerius with Poplicola. So the last that last defense by Horatio on the bridge seems to turn the table for Poplicola rather than Poplicola doing something himself, which seems a bit odd that he is then so venerated in, in Plutarch's lives. There are still other battles for... Um, there are still other battles for him to have to do. Publicola. Let's get a slide up here again, just so you can. Just so you have something to see. He does the same trick again with the Sabines. He realizes that if I, came, I can gain my, there's ways of gaining the allies with these. Um, there is also in this painting here I have, which is a popular enough subject, is M Musius, this, this man of Publicola's tribe, Musius, who puts his hand over the fire after being captured with an attempt to slay Lars Porsena, does not flinch. And this is also another contributing factor to Lars Porsena being like, okay, I need to align myself with this Publicola because his men seem to be of such an incredible character, way better than anything Tarquin has, has given me. So when he, when does he, when, uh, Publicola is trying to do the same to the Sabines. It's Appius of the Sabines that he tries to gain an alliance with. Is the people of the quietest and steadiest temper of the Sabines that Publicola picks out to try and get, gain this alliance. And informed of their approach, received them with all kinds of offices. He left the Claudian house behind him. Coming with a great army, they sat down at the Fidne and placed an ambuscade to 2,000 men near Rome. Post Postumius Balbus, his son-in-law, coming out with 1,000 men in the evening, was ordered to take the hills. Lucretius, attended with a body of the lightest and boldest men, was appointed to meet the Sabine horse. Lucretius charged the light horse. Publicola besieged the camp, so that on all sides the defeat and ruin came upon the Sabines. So you can see here he, he gains the trust of this, uh, what Plutarch calls the quietest and steadiest temper, this Appius, among the Sabines to know where they are and to be able to ambush and get rid of them. So there is an astuteness in battle here. This victory the Romans, though usually ascribing to such success to some god, attributed to the conduct of one captain. It was observed to be heard amongst the soldiers that Publicola had delivered their enemies uh, lame and blind. Publicola, having completed his triumph and bequeathed the city to the care of the succeeding consuls, died. 
thus closing a life which, so far as human life may be, had been full of all that is good and honorable. And that's how, at the very end, Plutarch links it back to Salon. Salon went to Croesus's place. And Croesus was obsessed with knowing who could be the happy man. Look at all my riches. And uh, Salon replies, it is the man who lives honorably, who goes to his work with dedication and with sincerity, who is the happiest man. And that is why Plutarch seems to think this man, Publicola, is Salon's happiest man. 